OVC, we are wit to live. God can do in a minute what you can't do in a lifetime. OVC, somos ricos en lo que más importa. Who is the church? We are the church. All in, all together. Somos un lugar familiar. The cross is extraordinary, and Jesus is the extra in the middle of our ordinary. OVC is the place to be. Because we care. You dig it, let's do it. Hey, we come here under the banner of the name of Jesus. He is the great I am. He is the most powerful. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He's the beginning, the end, and I've got to have my table. Here we go. You got it. Thank you. Blessed to be here today. How many of you are blessed to be here today? Yeah. Jesus is the blesser and the blessing. Everything else is a bonus. See a friend of mine who's here today? That's a bonus. Every moment of every day in the light of the Lord in 2020, because we have perfect vision through the Holy Spirit and through the power of his word, we can see clearly that in this second, this is a bonus. This is a blessing. Take a breath. Ah, that was a good one. God, the creator of all, Yeshua, Jehovah's salvation provided that so that I might praise him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It was a shock to the nation, to the world this week when nine people went down in a helicopter crash. One of those people being Kobe Bryant. I had no idea that Kobe Bryant had such a extended and lasting influence on so many people because of the smile that he wore, because of the father that he was and the husband and the athlete with the Lakers. If you didn't know, Kobe Bryant was killed in a helicopter accident earlier this week and the world stopped to mourn, sadness, shock, like, what? Kobe Bryant, like, in perfect health, prime of his life, retired, no needs, he's not here anymore? And I was watching ESPN, one of the commentators said this, he said, the world is in shock, but you know what? We don't have time to mourn because life goes on. And I was like, that's the problem. The problem is this, we think, well, that's the way life is, that's the way the world goes. And yes, we understand the mortality of all men, but we need to stop. We need to think about what is most important. We need to think about life. We need to think about why are we here? What is our purpose anyway, just to put our head down and grind through 80 years on the planet? or? Are we here for a grander and greater purpose? And the answer to that is we are here for a greater and a grander purpose according to our great God in heaven. And we have to see that through the will and the word of God because, hey, death been conquered. There's no boast in the sin in the grave anymore. Where, where is the sting of the grave? Jesus has overcome and he's provided life and he's provided life more abundantly. And there's power in the name of Christ. There's salvation in the name of Christ. There's hope in the name of Christ. Apart from the name of Christ, there's doubt, there's despair, there's discouragement. But peace be still that you and I can embrace the great good news that our God in heaven has provided to us with everything we are and everything we have. And that's why we're here today. We're here to celebrate the resurrection and the life and the plan and the promises of God together as God's children. Have you ever received Christ as Savior? Have you ever come to the end of yourself to say, God, without you, I am hopeless, but with you, all things are possible. The Bible says whenever we admit that we're sinners, we repent and say, I'm no longer going to walk my way, God. I'm going to turn and go your way. Whenever we believe in our heart that Jesus came, that he died, that he rose again in power so that we might walk in newness of life, everything changes. Jesus is the immediate, the eternal difference maker, and it comes through faith, through believing. Let faith, let faith rise up. Where does faith rise up? It comes out of the scripture. It comes out of the supernatural Holy Spirit, most powerful God that you can't even come comprehend, but you receive his invitation. 
You don't invite him in. That's crazy. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the name above all names invited you to receive a free gift so that you can confess him as Lord and decide, I'm going to follow him. He's got the answers. He's got the hope. Peace be still in my heart whenever I'm diagnosed with cancer, whenever I'm going through depression, whenever I'm dealing with circumstance in life. You know what? God's got this because he's got you. That's the life that God wants us to live. So we're going to start in James today. In James chapter 4, I hope you came to be encouraged, but I also hope that you came to be challenged. We're going to finish this service by doing a few baptisms. I think we did five or six the first service, and I'm going to invite you to consider if you've never been baptized to give a testimony to this body, this faith family, that you are in Christ and Christ is in you visibly. Get baptized at the end of the service. We're going to talk about that. We also are going to talk about serving Christ today. That's going to be the end of our All In and All Odd Together series. But before we go there, this is where God took me right after I watched uh, or looked at uh, um, the report of Kobe's passing. James chapter 4, verse 13. James, a half-brother of Jesus, says this, Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. How many of you have planned for your day? Super Bowl. How many of you have planned for the week? How many of you have planned for the month? How many of you crazy leaders out there go, I got a five-year plan. Let me show it to you. You show it to me, and I'll show you something that's not going to work out. Some of you are like, I've been there, Pastor. I used to do the five-year plan. It, maybe it lasts two years, and once I got to five years, I'm like, that didn't work. But that's okay. Keep planning. We all plan things. We all have a calendar, and God gives us a brain to do so. But this is so important, what we're getting ready to read. It says this, yet, as you make those plans, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Whoa. Stop. So wait a second. As I make all my plans according to my ambition, according to my goals, and according to my stair-step ladder to succeed, according to my will and man's ways, you mean that may not happen? Mm -mm, it may not. Keep going. What is your life? The question is. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. A mist of 60 years, 80 years, 100 years. Life is a vapor. Who can know what tomorrow and even this afternoon holds? In verse 15, it says, instead, instead of doing all of that in and of yourself, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The phraseology is kind of funny, but let's not trip over to the clarity. It says what we should say each and every day as we get up, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. That was one of the greatest things Jesus ever said. And if we want to live like Jesus, what would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? God, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, use me in a greater and most powerful way according to your wishes and will. I want to walk in accordance with your spirit. It's not my life, it's yours. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to find yours. That's what this is saying. It's saying, yes, you can make those plans. But here's the thing. All those plans are for naught unless the Lord Jesus Christ is the banner and Lord over all of it. So it says, verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. This week, first time in my entire life, I'd never read that verse correctly. I'd read it, but I probably passed over it. This week, I'm reading it, I'm like, bam! You know how the Lord hits you in the face like with something so clear? It says, as it is, you boast in your own arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And I'm thinking, how evil have I been? I mean, literally, how many plans have I made in the last week and not even talked to God about it? God, give me wisdom, your wisdom, to do what you want to do versus, okay, I'm going to do this. Now, God, bless me. Bless me as I do this. The difference is Jesus is preeminent. He's worthy of all praise. He's number one. There is no number two. No second, right? All I am, all God has made me to be is to give him glory and to walk in newness of life with him. Forgive me, Lord, of my arrogance and pride that has kept me from seeing life for what it is. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, that's sin. I've used that a million times in counseling. I'll look at somebody. Now, we've talked about this. You know what's right to do, right? Yes, Pastor Steve. Well, if you don't do that, that's sin. Bam! Pastor nails them. 
Like, oh, man, now, okay, it's back in your court. you got to do it. In the context of this verse, now I know that my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. God is worthy of all praise and glory. Everything that I do each and every day, I should come in a conscious way, acknowledging him, trusting in him, and he will direct my paths. So as God's word gets into you in 2020, you'll have a perfect 2020 vision for what life is, and there will be a peace and a stillness in your heart. Even as you face the uncertainty and unexpected, he will provide you the sustenance and the seasoning to glorify him. And when you do, your testimony of faith goes out and everybody goes, man, what's up with that guy? He's going through hell on earth, but he's like super chill about it. And then guess what? Have you ever prayed for God to open a door and then you walked right by it? Oh, that was a low one. God, please open a door for witnessing today. And you're at work and somebody comes and say, I can't, I'm having such a hard time with my wife. We had the worst blowout. Hey, I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> Right? We've all been guilty of that. Let's look for where God is moving and let's walk through the door. I love what Pat Williams said, the vice president and co-founder of the Orlando Magic. This is what he said on Fox News. And, uh, and Brian, I think it's important to point out, and I do want to talk to the country today, if I may, uh, this, this uh, horrible feeling we all have. But uh, God knows the minute everybody is going to come into this world, he also knows the exact minute when we're going to depart from this world. He knows. And in this period, from birth to death, the real issue is, what have we done about Jesus Christ? And, and by inviting him into our heart, we're assured of an eternal destination in heaven. Uh, people are, are, are really thinking about their own mortality. I think that's what's happened here. And so uh, God's in control, and Jesus comes into our heart, and that's the difference maker. And he went to church with his daughter in the morning. Yes. He had communion, so I think uh, on some level he, he got your message. Uh, Pat, you, when we ta asked you to come in, because you are so respected in sports and basketball specifically as well, you got on a plane and you came in and you told the country how you feel. I truly appreciate it. Well, Brian, I'm, I'm one of your biggest fans. Uh, I heard you speak last year in Orlando, right. and I'm telling you, that was powerful. So I'm, uh, I'm always happy to be with you, Brian. Thanks so much. You wrote a book. The latest one is Character Carved in Stone, The Twelve Core Virtues of West Point that Build Leaders and Produce Success. You've done it in every level. Thanks so much for putting it in perspective. Good, Brian. Thanks, great, Pat. Great to see you. One thing he said there at the end, I don't want to think that, I don't want to think that you got it right. I don't want to think and hope that you got it right. I don't want to think, well, you've, you've kind of done these things, you've, you've checked the boxes, so you're probably good with God. I don't want to think that. I want to know that. First John says, I want you to know that you know that you know that you've been saved, that you've been cleansed, and that you're walking in freedom. How do you know that? Through faith in Christ. Christ alone, for by faith you save, not through works. Jesus is the immediate and eternal difference maker, and God knows. That was the theme of that. God knows you don't. God is God, I am not. What is this afternoon? I don't know, but I do know this. You're sitting right here, right now, and God's love can immerse you, can overwhelm you, can baptize you into newness of life. And that's where we want to go today. You receive it through faith. If you have your notes, pull those out. We are finishing our All In and All Together series. Some of you are like, I thought you were finished. That was a great message, Pastor. I'm ready to go, go to lunch. No, that was just the introduction. Okay, okay. So we've been called to serve. All of us have been called to serve. Here at Ocean View, we say we serve him by serving him. We wait on the Lord as we wait on the Lord, right? We're waiters on the Lord. We serve the Lord. We serve the gospel. We serve the grace, the goodness, the hope of Christ through the way that we live and how we interact with other people. Mark chapter 10, verse 43, I invite you to read it on the screen along with me. It says, but whoever, this is Jesus talking, so it's like, you know, when Jesus talks, everybody listens. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, talking to his disciples, the learners, the followers of Christ. Hey, if you want to be great, you're going to surf. <laughs> Has your boss ever told you that? Hey, you want to work up the corporate ladder? Well, you're going to start at the bottom and earn your dues. How many of you love that whenever you were right out of college? I can't wait to do all the piddly stuff. 
It's awesome. It'll season us. So what Jesus says, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. How many people are you going to serve? Pretty much everyone. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man, which is Christ, came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus came. He came to be the truth, to testify the truth. He's the incarnate word. He came to seek and to save that which is lost, but he also came to be the servant of all. And he served all of us, grace, faith, heaven, joy, the peace that surpasses understanding through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus wants us to do the same thing. He wants us to die to self, live to him, and serve the new life to the world. Galatians chapter 5. It's a great verse. How many of you want to be in bondage? You want to be tied up, chained down, duct taped to the fence? All of us are like, yes, I'm going to live under the control of someone else. How many of you want to be free? Free indeed. Free to dance in the depths, right? I love that song. I'm going to be so at peace whenever the winds and the waves come. I'll just dance in the problems. I'll just dance in the circumstances. We're going to dance according to the scripture in just a moment. Talking about that. Verse 13. For you were what? Holy cow, it's like a mouse out there this morning. You guys are all getting stoked up for Super Bowl later, right? When I say, the Chiefs scored, what are you going to do? Yeah. What if I say, and the, the 49ers scored? Yeah. Oh, I like that. A lot of booze there. Okay, anyway. You were called to freedom, brothers. I'm going to brave heart it. Freedom! All the angels just sang right then. I'm telling you. Okay. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Serve one another. Don't just come to church to get served or be served. We come to serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. That's why he uses several. <laughs> you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The one word is love, but he says love your neighbor. How are you going to do that? Serve. Hey, if you want to be free from depression, and depression is real, frustration is real, discouragement is real. You know one of the ways that you can be freed from that according to the scripture is a meditation of, of the heart on God's law. Obedience in faith to him. But here it is, serve somebody. If you're always thinking about your problems, your circumstances, the paralysis of the analysis, day after day, minute after minute, I'm telling you, get free, serve somebody. Fill your day with helping somebody that is, has more need than you, and it'll fill you up with so much joy that you can't wait to get out there tomorrow and help someone else. And before long, you will start to forget mostly about the things that you're going through because you're seeing victory accomplished in you, through you, and right in front of you. So, Understand this, the day you were saved, the day you received Christ as Savior was the day you were called. Called is the word here. You were called to freedom, freedom in Christ. Freedom comes whenever we serve him by serving him. We have a mission that unites us. Talking about a few weeks ago, we have a mission that unites us, and then we have a vision that invites us. The Lord invites you and I to represent him. Have you ever represented a higher authority in your life? Any of you ever had a boss? You guys are all your own bosses? That's awesome. You serve others, but whenever I first took my first job, I had a boss that told me what to do who was my higher authority, and I represented him. And you know what? That's awesome. Today, I have a few people that get to work for me, which is awesome. But you know what? I'm, I'm to be the servant of all, a servant leader to them to express how Jesus led me, how I want to lead them so that they can lead the next generations. We want to serve, and when we serve, it sets us free. Now, let me tell you, I'm going to give you a leg up on everything the world has to offer to you. John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to his followers, peace be with you. How many of you ever needed peace at work? Because your boss is not a very friendly person. <laughs> or he's just unreasonable. Peace. Jesus knew that his disciples in the Great Commission were gonna need peace because, keep reading, 
As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Hmm, interesting. Whenever we talk about serving the Lord, we think that it's a decision that we need to make. I'm not serving now, but I am serving tomorrow. No, you are serving. The day you were saved is the day you were called. God's not waiting on you. He already told you you've been called and sent. That, that's a freeing thing right there. We sometimes, oh, I'm going to serve God part of the year and not the rest of the year. No, you're, you're serving. You're already signed up. You're in the military. Lord's army, right? Keep going. So when he had said this, he breathed on them, said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, how are you going to do the work of God? Through the Holy Spirit in you. You're going to work with God, not for God. You can do a work for God, but it's better to do a work with God. God through the power of the Holy Spirit. What an identity. If somebody said, so what do you do for a living? I work for the living God who pushes the waves to shore. Wow, that's a pretty good title there. I'm an ambassador of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, pal. But I do get to clean the deck of the ship every day for the glory of the Lord. But I do work for the admiral or the president. But more importantly, I do work for God Almighty. Wow, that's a game changer. Whenever you're called at work to do just the mundane and the busy, ever, anybody ever have to do busy work? You know what will free you to have a good attitude while you do it? Lord, I hate doing this. You know I hate doing this. And I don't even like the person who asked me to do this. But I'm going to do it for you. And all of a sudden, I can be cheerful about it. I've done it myself. It works. Okay, number one, we're called to live radical believers as radical believers. Radical means deeply rooted, deeply rooted in the truth, deeply rooted in a relationship with Christ, deeply rooted in the scriptures, and deeply rooted in the family of God. Whenever we're radical, not crazy, wacky, out of control, we're rooted deeply, and then we live loco. We live as if there's no tomorrow. Today's the day to serve the Lord. I was thinking about this this week, and I was trying to narrow it down you know, our mission statement as a church is we exist to glorify God by helping people find and fully follow Jesus. So every Sunday when I show up like this, I don't just show up to, to go through life. I don't just put my head down, oh, it's another Sunday, go through. I show up, here it is, to invest in a church, to invest in Christ's church, so that they will give glory to God and not live like the world. I want to equip, to train, to encourage, to meet the needs. Ministry is serving you by serving him to you so that you will walk in newness of life and be strong in the faith so that others look to you and go, wow, something's different about them, and you have the opportunity. You go into the highways and hedges, compelling them to come in because of a testimony of faith to say it's because of Jesus in me that I have peace. That is why I get to come here. So my desire is to train up a flavorful church. You know how I talk about stirring, Hebrews 10 talks about stirring us. I want to be the most irritating church in the whole South Bay so we might irritate everybody with the love of Jesus, right? God is forming in us in the culture that I've seen over the last few years that God is growing and developing is doing just that globally, all over the world. We continue to become more like Christ as we continue to love one another, serve one another, and live faithful lives. So in Matthew chapter 5, 13, Jesus says something to us, and we've all seen this before because we read it often. We talk about being lit to live as a church. Jesus says something powerful, and it fires me up every time I read it. It says, you church are the salt of the earth. Who's the church? We are the church. So, so Jesus says, you guys are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? There are far too many Christians and then far too many churches that have faded and lost their saltiness, their purpose, their preservative work on the, on the earth, but not at Ocean View. We're thriving, we're vibrant, we're moving, we're looking, we're desperate on God. Then it says, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Then it says this, you're the light of the world. So you're the salt, but you're also the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be 
hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and do something. Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we want to be salt and we want to be light and we want to have an effect on our world so that God receives the glory. And everybody's like, I knew that already. I knew that already. We are lit to live. Feeding San Diego set another record yesterday. I don't know the numbers. I was just told we assisted more people on one weekend than we ever have in the history of doing Feeding San Diego. There was a lady that almost ran me over in her truck yesterday. Krista was with me crying with her window down just to thank me for all that we're doing in the South Bay for people. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. What an opportunity. This place, everybody who helps with that, that is, that is your children giving glory to you, doing amazing things. And that's, that's happening all over the place. So we get fired up. I want everybody on I-5 headed to Mexico and everybody on I-5 headed from Mexico to see like this flame on the hill, right? Like, wow, what's going on up there? Somebody set fire to the church. I hate those songs when it says, Lord, light a fire in me, you know, set us on fire. I'm like, man, I don't, that's uncomfortable. Don't set me on fire. But we want to live as if we're on fire, right? So people can see us. So we're bright and shining with hope. Now, here it is. We read those verses and we're like, yes, let's go. Let's do it. Let's pray. We got to back up. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, gives us the 2020 vision we need. Blessed are you. Wow, I like that part. Let's stop there. It means joyful. Psalms 1, we looked at it a few weeks ago. Blessed are you, children of God. Amen. Promises of God, glory of God. Amen. Then it keeps going. When others revile you. Everybody say revile like the great emperor of the dark side. Revile. That was pretty good. It was scary. That is an evil word. I don't like it when others revile me and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Don't you love it when people slander you and gossip about you and tell lies about you? Yes, do it again. I hope I get to go to work. I get to work the church. I get to go to work wherever I work and maybe everybody will abuse me today. It'll be so awesome. I, I've never prayed that. But keep reading, verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow, that was really encouraging. I know they killed some of the prophets. That's not encouraging to me. But it says rejoice, be glad, great is your reward in heaven. I'm giving you the big picture here. The big picture of the way a Christian lives is the fact that there can be peace amidst the circumstances that make no sense. Did Jesus go through anything on the earth? I'm just trying to remember. Did anybody falsely accuse him? Did anybody mistreat the Son of God worthy of all praise, glory, and honor? Uh, he was crucified. So when you go to live for him in this world and the other four people that you work with in the office don't invite you to go to the whiskey tasting party at the end of the week, you know what? That's okay. You're living a clean testimony before them so that when they hit rock bottom and they get drunk and it destroys their life, guess who they're going to come talk to? You. <laughs> Every time. Because you're allowing Christ to do a work in you. We become salt and light. Listen to this. When we joyfully embrace suffering. When we're going through stuff, you've heard me say, you know what? If you want to get to know God deeper, pray for a problem. Pray for a problem and it'll drive you so deep. It'll be the greatest answer to your prayers that you've never prayed. Lord, things are going so great. I just need a problem in my life so that I'll pray more. <laughs> Have a problem. Guess what you'll do? You'll pray more. You'll be more desperate. Mm. How many of you ever been through a problem? How many of you are going to have a problem? Welcome to the club. God wants to use those in your life to grow you to become more like him. I know that sounds completely backwards, right? But how many things did Jesus say were completely backwards? Embrace suffering. Why? Because it'll, it'll work out a perfect steadfast character in you. A radical life is birthed out of being radically rooted. How many of you ever made an investment in your life? Investment. You invest today so that you'll gain rewards tomorrow. You're looking at the end, the long term, so that you will reap rewards on the investment that you make 
today. Here's something amazing. I was thinking about it this week, and whenever it came to me, I looked at Chris and said, listen to this. We as Christians invest in eternity. We as Christians want to invest in that which matters most. We as Christians want to be rich in that which matters most. So God is preeminent. Our focus is him. Our relationship is with him. So whenever we invest in that, he's already given us our great reward on the front end. I don't have to wait until the end. I don't have to wait until heaven. He's already said the day that I was saved is the day that I was called. And guess what? Oh, Christ, by the way, is living in you. Yes. <laughs> I just spit all over you, Rich. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> Christ in me, the hope of glory. You just received the greatest front end payoff that you could ever imagine. Now, sure, there's heaven coming beyond what we can comprehend. And sure, there are riches and precious and pleasant riches he's going to fill your house with. And sure, there's going to be joy in the midst of turmoil, all those promises. But figure this out. I'm going to invest my life in his life and lose my life. And then, oh, I gained his. What? Live in the light of that truth this week. That is radical because it's deeply rooted in what matters most. Okay, guys. We are, radically, we are called to radically follow Jesus. We're called to radically follow Jesus. I'm going to fast forward through this point so we can get to the last point in talking about radical baptisms. But far too often we want to follow Jesus on our terms. Let's be honest. Far too often we want to follow Jesus on our terms. Did you know Jesus was an evangelist? He came to seek and save that which is lost. So imagine him walking on the countryside of Judea and many hundreds of people came around because they had heard that he was the Messiah and he had a message of hope and they wanted to hear from him. Did you know Jesus did not serve snow cones or cotton candy to his followers or the fo interested followers? I, I want our church to be tough and tender at the same time. I can stand here and tell you that you guys, if you'll just fill this out, I'm telling you, God will prosper your life. You're going to have easy peasy living. When you come here to do any of these ministries, I'm telling you, it's going to go exactly as you expect and everybody's going to love you and you aren't even going to have to work hard or break a sweat. Just do it the way that you want in the convenience of your time and never be uncomfortable because God would never, God forbid that any of us would ever be uncomfortable or or asked to do something that just doggone it doesn't fit our passion. Oh gosh, I could go all day on that one. I want to be the tell you the truth. How many of you in the military? Any? Few? How many of you know somebody in the military? Okay. How many of you heard of the military? <laughs> Got it. Okay, that's everybody. How many of you ever talked to someone in the military that's been in for 10 years and they start telling you about their experiences? And you ask them, you know, when did you start? How were you recruited? And they will say, man, if they would have ever told me what it was really going to be like, or gosh, I did, they didn't tell me. You know, their recruiter says, listen, you're going to travel the world. You're going to see all these beautiful cultures and places. You're going to make all this money. You're going to get free college education just whenever you want, however you want. It's going to be amazing. I mean, you're going to sail the seven seas, and you're 18, you're like, Man, that sounds amazing. I don't have nothing else going. Let's do it. <laughs> then two years in, you're like, oh, I've made a bad decision, right? But 10 years into it, wow, you've been asked to do some things that were hard. But guess what? If I said, hmm, if they would have told you on the front end what you learned in those 10 years, would you have signed up? Most people would say, no way, no way. But then I would ask, because you did sign up and you did work faithfully for those 10 years, how far into God's character did that take you? How much more seasoned? How much more faithful? How much more mature are you today because you went through what you went through? And the answer is incredibly more mature. I want to equip you as a church to go where God is taking us in the next five minutes from Luke chapter 14. Jesus was an evangelist. This is what he said. It would be a horrible marketing scheme for today's modern church. But we are not going to go the direction that the world wants to take us. We're going to follow where Jesus takes us. 
Now, great crowds accompanied Christ, and he turned and said to them, listen to this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, if I would have heard that, like you, on the first, on my first appointment with Jesus, I'd be like, hmm, that guy's crazy. I'm out of here, right? But some stayed, some heard him out. Let's keep going. It says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, and wife, and children, brother, and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We know because we've studied in Matthew, the great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Our heart, our heart, our head, our heart, our hands are dedicated to Christ. Christ is telling people to be my disciple, to be a follower of me, to serve me by serving me, to love me with all your heart and soul. I'm one and there is no other. That's what he's saying. Now, we know the entire New Testament tells us to love one another, serve one another, love our wives, love our children, provide for our kids, right? We know that. But the greater truth is Jesus is saying, I am first, I'm preeminent, everything else is not, right? But how often do we get that out of balance? So in 2020, what God wants us to do is to seek him first, and all these other things will be added unto you. Number three, let's go to number three. We are called to a radical baptism. Radical is rooted. Baptism, the word, means submerged or immersed. Baptism. How many of you have been baptized? It's just, how many of you have been baptized? You followed Christ in faith, and you said, I want to proclaim Christ to the world in baptism. If your hand didn't go up in ju just a moment ago, today's the day. Why is that? I want to tell you why you should be baptized right now from several passages. Matthew 3, 16. You ever heard, what would Jesus do? Yeah? How about what did Jesus do? Jesus was baptized and it pleased the Father. The Father is pleased whenever you get baptized. Matthew 28, Christ commands it. He doesn't suggest it. He doesn't ask, hey, whenever it's good for you, he says you should do it as soon as you have believed. It says, go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Make disciples, teaching them, and then after they're taught, baptize them. Acts 18.8 says that being baptized demonstrates that you are a fully devoted follower of Christ. So there's a few reasons. Please the Father, obey Jesus, and share with the world your faith in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. We're almost finished. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Baptism. Hopefully, this is intriguing and helpful. Paul says to the church, who's the church in here? Yeah. We're the church. So 1 Corinthians says, I delivered unto you what is of first importance. You should highlight, underline, box this. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, and he just defined what's most important. I delivered to you what is of first importance. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection. That's first. That's what Paul says. Then in Romans chapter 6, he says this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, meaning receiving Christ, were baptized into his death? Then verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What does that mean? Maybe a little bit confusing. Here's the clarity. Jesus came, lived a perfect life, glorified his Father in life and by death on the cross, paying for the sins of you, of, of you but of all men. Then he was buried in a borrowed tomb, but on the third day, he rose again. We've just been baptized. He lived, he died, he rose again, walked in newness of life, and is seated at the right hand of the Father today. He gives us an example that when we, when we die to our flesh, when we repent of our sin, that which is old is dead. Rise unto new life. Put off the old man, the old ways. 
raise up and walk in newness of life. I keep doing this because that is the symbol of the baptism in the New Testament. Baptism is not your salvation. It's a works. It's a works to profess Christ as your Savior. Even the, the thief on the cross that spent paradise, went to paradise with Jesus, he was never, never baptized. So baptism isn't your salvation. It's a picture of your salvation. So here's the question. Have you ever been baptized? You know, we baptized like how many? 57 on one Sunday last year. Pastor Bates told me that was the most we ever on one Sunday in the history of the church. It was amazing. Um, so we baptize from time to time so that people that come to faith or that come into a new faith family, like you were baptized in Virginia, you've moved to San Diego, saved once, baptized is connecting with the body of Christ. So if you moved here, you're going to be here for four years, you're like, I want everybody in here to know that I'm a follower of Jesus. We want to know that. Don't keep it hidden. Don't keep it secret. Get baptized. We would love for you to come today in faith. And here's why. Because we want to live for the applause of nailed, scarred hands. Why are you here in 2020? I want to live for Christ. Guess how you can do it today? If you've never been baptized, go all in. Say, I'm with Jesus. I'm going to follow him. You know what the other thing you can do? Last week I gave you these. I said, pray about some areas that you might be able to serve. Those of you that are already serving, hey, keep it up. Keep it up. But those of you that God is moving into a place of service in this church, here's the card that you can check some interest, one or two boxes, and we're going to get back with you. What was crazy is we had 60, how many? 65 cards. 65 cards turned in last week. I mean, hey, you guys are excited about serving. Like he said next week, but you know what? I'm already done with it. Here, we're going to serve. So I would ask everyone to stand. If you've come here this morning to get baptized, the ladies are going to be on, the, on stage right, men on stage left. If you've come here today and you're like, I didn't bring my swimsuit, don't you worry. We got it. We got you covered, literally, with shorts and T-shirt. We even have robes up there if you want one of those. So if you want to get baptized today and follow the Lord in obedience, man, we would love to do that because we as a church family are going to celebrate that with you. Ladies over here, men over here, the rest of us with these cards, right here is where we're going to put them. We got like 50 on the, on the stage earlier in the first service. Just come forward, lay them right here, and I would invite you to pray and say, Lord, Wow, I'm going to step out into the deep right now because I just checked OVSP and I want to coach some kindergartners. Everybody's like, they're insane. Who would do that? I am. I'm going to be kindergarten this year. I did kindergarten last year. I love kindergarten soccer. If that's you and God's prompted your heart. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. If God's prompted you to be a coach, check it. Come right here. You can say, Lord, I'm stepping out in the deep with you because kindergartners are crazy. But I'm going to do this for your glory. Use me. Go back to your seat and buckle up because God answers those kinds of prayers. I'm thankful that we're here. Lord, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for this place, for the joy it is to know you as Savior and to come into a place with people who profess you as King of kings and Lord of lords who want to follow you with everything that they have and all that we do and we need each other. We have to be accountable to one another to love each other with the love of Christ as you put an umbrella of protection and provision over us. We're going through stuff, Lord, and I need your spirit every day in my life. And I pray for your spirit to do a healing work in the lives of people here today. I pray, Father, that you would raise us up, that like in Ezekiel, you'd breathe life into some dry bones, that we would stand up and that we would roll with you, that we would live for you, and that you would do a mighty and great work for your glory here, seeing people saved and baptized this year. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ocean View Church, let's pray together. Let's pray this morning with desperate hearts, knowing that God can do in a moment what you and I can't do in a lifetime.